Let's design, simulate, and build an RC oscillator using an op amp and a twin T filter network. We can generate a sine wave using an RC oscillator, which will use an amplifier. We're using an op amp and an RC filter. And for this, we're going to use a twin T notch filter in the negative feedback loop of an op amp. So, how do we turn an amplifier? into an oscillator, and how does this particular RC network help us oscillate at a specific frequency? In order for an amplifier to oscillate, according to the Barkhausen criterion, we need two things. We need the phase shift around the feedback loop, and we will look at this more in detail. We need the phase shift to be a multiple of 360 degrees, which could be zero as well. And we need the loop gain, the amplification around the feedback loop, to be one. And what that means is we're providing positive feedback instead of negative feedback in order to oscillate. And we get a phase shift in a circuit by using a reactive element like an inductor or a capacitor. So if we're using an RC network, we can generate a phase shift and we can design that so we end up with a total 360 degree phase shift around our loop at a certain frequency, and that means a signal at the output of our op amp being fed back in phase will just keep building up and building up, giving us positive feedback. So to try to simplify things enough to just bring it together intuitively right now and just get this thing up and running, here's a block diagram op amp configuration we need. To meet the criteria for oscillation at a certain frequency, we need the total phase shift around this whole loop to come out as a multiple of 360 degrees, including zero degrees, and that will give us positive feedback at that frequency, allowing the signal to keep building up and the op amp can oscillate. But we only want the total phase shift around the loop to be a multiple of 360 for that frequency. This feedback loop is just acting as regular negative feedback for all other frequencies, and the op amp remains stable and does not oscillate at any other frequency. So if we can come up with a circuit to target a frequency and give us a 180 degree phase shift at that frequency, we're good. And the reason we need 180 degrees in this feedback circuit is because we're using the inverting input of the op amp. So automatically, if we put in a sine wave, let's say it's like this, the op amp itself is going to shift it 180 degrees because it inverts it on the output. So the op amp does a 180 degree shift, therefore we need to add another 180 degrees here. So we take this signal, invert it, and it looks like this again. The op amp will invert it, and it looks like this again. So that's how we get positive feedback for the frequency targeted in this circuit. Only at that frequency we have a 180 degree phase shift. So the way we do this with a twin T filter, it's got two T's where one's a low pass and one's a high pass filter. And when we put them in parallel, any signals that would normally be low enough to pass through unattenuated on the low pass, they will pass through this network and they'll get blocked by the high pass because they're attenuated. And the opposite is true if you put in a high frequency signal. So the end result is you get a merging characteristic of these two filters. And it looks like this. Any frequency below the target is passed through unattenuated. Anything above is passed through. But as we get toward our target frequency, both filters are trying to cut it off and we get it notched out. And we also get a phase shift of 180 degrees somewhere in here. To make the target frequency of the notch filter simplified to frequency equals 1 over 2 pi RC, we choose these components so that we choose a common resistor for these two, and this resistor is one half of that value. Then we choose a common capacitor for these two, and the other capacitor is twice that value, and then the equation simplifies down. Then our idealized response is like this where at that frequency, we actually get a zero degree phase shift where we want 180. But it awkwardly states right here that essentially, instead of making this resistor exactly half of the other two, if we make it slightly less than half, the amplifier becomes an oscillator. And that's because this phase diagram totally changes and we can get 180 degrees. It'll make more sense when we look at this in a simulation. So if I want to target 1 kilohertz, and to make component values easy, let's say I want 
10 nano, so I'm going to have 10 nano, 10 nano, and 20 nano. What I got to do is calculate the R value. So resistance then equals 1 over 2 times pi times 1 kilohertz times 10 nano capacitance equals about a 16K resistor. So that should give me a response similar to this idealized filter. And here's the filter in an LT spice simulation. I have a 20T filter, 10 nano, 10 nano, and then 20, and then the calculated resistor, 16K, 16K, and half of that is 8K. So this is the idealized filter, and here's our phase and frequency response. So at the notch frequency of one kilohertz, if we get close to a phase of zero degrees, so what we need to do, change this resistor slightly less than half of the other two. So let's just make it 7.5K just to see what happens. Rerun. And now suddenly we have minus 180 degrees possible in here still within our notch. So I put the cursor as close as I could to minus 180 degrees and we're at 1.012 kilohertz which is close to our calculated target value. And now I've built the actual op-amp oscillator circuit with the 20 filter in the feedback loop. I have a split plus and minus 9 volt power supply on an op-amp. And this extra right here, I needed this to kick it into oscillation. It's on this version of the circuit as well. Although I've seen this with the non-inverting input tied directly to ground or just tied to ground through a resistor without any feedback, but I could only get it working in the real world and in simulation by doing this. And I had to tweak the values here to get it to work. It actually works cleanly in a real circuit. On this one, I still get distortion at the top and bottom, but it's okay for what we're doing. So here, if we zoom in, when we power on, there's going to be noise in any circuit. So once that noise has a chance to go through this feedback loop and we end up targeting and having positive feedback effects on our target frequency, that frequency will build up until we get to full swing. And like I said, this one's kind of showing distortion, but we'll see the real circuit looking a lot better. And if I put cursors on here between two peaks, I did my best to try to line this up, but even still, we're not quite one kilohertz. We're at 923 hertz. And I just chose an arbitrary op amp that existed in here. I'm going to use a 741 op amp in the real world. So this shows that we can get in the ballpark. The ideal calculations may need to be tweaked, but we can get a sine wave oscillator. So let's try some real components on a breadboard and see what happens. Here's the oscillator circuit with a 741 op amp. I'm using a plus and minus split supply from this breadboard buddy PCB project. The twin T feedback circuit is right here with the resistors and capacitors. And there's a potentiometer right here from the output of the op amp back to the non-inverting input as a divider from output to ground to allow me to mix in some extra feedback. I took a single acquisition from power on. So when we apply power, we start with a lower amplitude sine wave and it builds up until it gets to the maximum we are set for, which right now is peak to peak 14.6 volts. It's a little bit shaky. That could be partly the breadboard layout and decoupling and stuff like that. So I'll reduce the gain with the feedback potentiometer so we're close to 6 volts peak to peak now, and we're around 650 hertz. So if we zoom in on this, it looks like a relatively clean and stable sine wave. But our original calculation was targeting a frequency higher than 650 hertz. So I've taken these filter, resistor, and capacitor components out one by one and measured them with a meter. Let's plug those exact component values back into the SPICE simulation and see how that compares and how much of an impact those components will have on the frequency. So I came back to the simulation and I entered in the exact component values as I measured them with a fluke meter. And now the simulation tells us, if I put a cursor, when we are close to a 180 degree phase shift, which is what we need for oscillation, the frequency now with these component values is 683 hertz in this ideal 
simulation, which is kind of close to our 650 or so hertz real-world oscillator. And when we simulate the entire oscillator with these actual component values, and we put cursors peak to peak as best we can, our frequency in the oscillator is around 650 hertz, very similar to the real world. So that all looks pretty good. And now we can either just use this as a standalone fixed frequency oscillator. For example, if we tweak it to be one kilohertz, we can use it to test audio amplifiers as a sine wave input, or we can use this as a building block and generate analog synthesizer sounds like drum sounds, bell sounds, all kinds of things. And we may look at some other RC sine wave oscillator configurations. But for now, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing if you haven't already. I'll see you on the next video.